because you know you hear a lot of producers complaining all the time about rappers don't want to pay for beats rappers always want my beats for free this and that if you've only been making beats for six months a year two years just shut up all right but for those of us who have really invested a lot into our craft into our business and so forth that can be a frustrating scenario to find ourselves in however it's like saying all women are the same i'm not dating anymore it's just it's it's ignorant okay cool what's going down it is the music entrepreneur club podcast powered by beatstars.com we're live on beatstars.com every monday and thursday at 3 p.m eastern standard time for a free music business mentorship program that's what the mec is that's what we're all about we're happy to be bringing it to you for free no membership required uh what's going down dan this is episode 74 how do you feel about 74th episode uh i'm still feeling good um I realized that there are a lot of people giving music industry advice and probably more people than ever before. It's a lot of advice being given. Like, I, I just hope that people find their right sources of advice and I hope that they're putting things in action, right? Because you can, like, a lot of people get all the advice in the world and they keep getting advice and then they might get some conflicting advice and then they just might be paralyzed and not moving or not trying anything. Um, so I think it's great that people want advice. Hopefully you're getting it from people that know what they're talking about, but that's the easy part. So I, I want to see more people starting to put things in action and, and having some wins. Yeah, that's a can of worms. Um, anyway, yeah. shout out to Angel Ray for the shirt. <laughs> I do want to say she's a producer. I want to talk a little bit about something producer related. So um, today on the MEC Instagram at Music Entrepreneur Club, I posted a tweet uh, that said, if some artists don't want to pay for your beats, that's a reflection of how little they value their own art. That doesn't mean your beats aren't worth anything. Know your value. Find others who recognize and respect that they're out there. Because, you know, you hear a lot of producers complaining all the time about rappers don't want to pay for beats. Rappers always want my beats for free, this and that. If you've only been making beats for six months, a year, two years, just shut up. All right. But for those of us who have really invested a lot into our craft, into our business and so forth, that can be a frustrating scenario to find ourselves in. However, it's like saying all women are the same. I'm not dating anymore. It's just, it's, it's ignorant because it's a broad sweeping generalization based on your lack of experience. You don't have a sample size of 10,000 women to make that determination. So saying, you know, rappers don't ever want to pay for beats, but they rap about money. Like, come on, man, you don't have a sample size of 10,000 people and you're probably not doing your marketing right. But this is kind of a softball way of saying, just stick it out. You got to find the right people who will respect that. Um, Cause I think, and you'll always hear me say that there are tons of problems on both sides of the creative coin. On one side, you have recording artists who don't understand the business. On the other hand, you have producers who don't understand the business and they miscommunicate quite a bit. Hopefully some of the information we put out can help uh, mend that riff. I know we did that when we could still tour because we had rooms that were full of producers and, and recording artists. But anyway, one of the comments was, Maybe they're unable to pay the fee, which in that case, the producer and artist can figure out back-end splits. If the producer is relying on the upfront fee, then maybe they don't believe in the long-term success of the record. I have my opinion on that, um, but I want to get yours. Every situation is different. You know, I think if you're dealing with a proven artist that has a track record of, you know, putting numbers on the board and in, in, in the streams are are healthy i you know correct me if i'm wrong pain but you probably would be more um flexible on the upfront free on, on the upfront fee mm -hmm. especially if you get you know get a, a good percentage of the streaming sales i think most artists buying beats haven't really gotten to that point yet and if the and if a producer sees a lot of potential in this artist and they want to build long term then maybe that's another reason to be more flexible. The streams aren't there yet, but you know this person's got a lot of talent. They work hard. They're trending in the right direction. I want to build a relationship. 
So you, you might be more flexible. So that's another scenario where, you know, you may not have to pay for the beat up front. Um, but ultimately, I think more often than not, I think artists should be paying. Um, you know, we're entrepreneurs. We have to invest in the business, you mm-hmm. know, as a, as a cook or whoever. You have to invest in your ingredients. You can't, you know, can't get the sugar for free. You can't get you – know, everything's not free. We're a business, and other people are depending on, you know, being paid for their services, you know. So, yeah, there are situations where – it makes sense for a producer to be more flexible, you know, if they're thinking long-term and they're in a financial position to be able to do that, Um, you know, but I I believe producers should be compensated for their work up front. That's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think most people shouldn't disagree with that. No, I think people always want to create some kind of counterpoint to whatever is said on the internet but i do believe producers fall into this trap often because of that whole back end pitfall you hear people talking about the i had a producer comment um in reply to that tweet actually all um they said you know what i do is i just ask for the back end on the um performance royalties and the mechanical royalties and like the mechanical and performance royalties make up like 10 percent of a stream you're not getting anything because performance where you have to hit a certain threshold to even get paid through a PRO. If, if that, if that song gets a thousand streams, you're not getting a cent. And if it gets a hundred thousand streams, you might be getting a dollar, bro. Like, and this is a producer that I'm responding to right now. I think a lot of producers, like I said, they don't understand the business. They don't know that the master um, royalties make up, almost 60% of, of a stream. And so why would they, you know, they're going to be smug and say, well, I get my, my performance royalties. Performance royalties are nothing. When we're talking about streams, are they getting 400 spins weekly on terrestrial radio or satellite radio? No, they're not. Okay, cool. You're not making anything. So congratulations. You walked into a scenario thinking that you got yourself a good deal and you didn't. But going back to what you said, It's a huge red flag in any business when a person who's starting that business doesn't want to invest in that business. If, like you said, the restaurant analogy, you know, if I want to open up a restaurant and I'm looking for space for that restaurant and I'm talking to the, to the landlord and I'm saying, you know what, I really don't want to pay rent on this. Just give it to me. Eventually it'll, it'll make some money. They would laugh at you. Now, of course, you can think of a rare scenario in which you know the landlord and they know that you've successfully opened five other businesses in that same city and maybe you partner with them, but they're getting a lot more than just the pr- your presence in their space. They're getting a piece of your business. And so for me, you know, like say I had the opportunity years ago to work with one of my favorite rappers who was Soul. I've been listening to him forever. He was at the forefront of the, the, the great independent hip hop revolution in the, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. So I know that he, as a successful independent rapper and a successful independent label owner, with fans right now, myself included, knows what he's doing and brings a lot to the table. Yes, we're going to do a collaborative project and it worked out. We toured around the world. We're still making me. I just talked to him a second ago. Um, that's different from someone randomly contacting me and saying, yeah, yeah, just, um, I want these beats, but I'll, look, I'll just give you a back end. Number one, you should be getting the back end anyway because of how copyright law functions. Um, and a lot of producers don't know that either. So they're just, they're putting themselves in positions to be suckers. But, uh, you know, you don't know the vast ma- and you talk about this all the time, Dame. The vast majority of music doesn't get any streams. The vast majority of music published on these streaming sites gets zero streams or a hundred streams, and no one's making money off of a hundred streams. They're just not. They're not. And in addition to that, I would challenge any rapper, any producer, any singer who has this mentality of, um, 
you know, wanting a back end over some kind of lease fee, some kind of event, I challenge them to name all of the back end royalties and the agencies that collect them. I guarantee you that the, the majority of them can't. So these are realistic conversations. We have to, hard conversations we have to have with ourselves. If we're walking into a situation, puffing our chest out saying, I know I'm covered because I'm getting my back ends, name the back ends. If you can't name the back ends, that's your fault. So when you're sitting there wondering where the hell your royalty check is after two years of doing this bullshit, that is on you. That's not the rapper's fault. That's not the producer's fault. That's on you. Because you think back ends are just going to fall from the sky. Because the Migos said so in a song. They're getting radio play. <laughs> so, it, it, yeah, it, it's one of those frust ever frustrating conversations, but... Again, the solution is and always will be education. And it, it, I don't want to say learning the music business is, is easy, but it's damn sure not rocket science. It's not engineering. It's not physics. It's reading a book or two. It's, it's Googling stuff all the time and comparing sources. It's going to the damn library. You know, like this is free. So, you go to the library, pain. Me? Yeah, I don't go anywhere now with with COVID. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure Donald Passman's books are in in the public libraries. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, people just have to have more more respect for each other, more respect for each other's time um, and themselves. If yeah. If I was a producer coming up and somebody says, well, you just don't believe in the finished song, I'd be like, you're damn right. I don't believe in the finished song because I know most of the shit ain't going to be played until I get to a certain level, you know, or, or when I really lock in with people that I believe in. Um, so, yeah, give me my damn money. I don't really believe because the verse you just put off my track is trash. Um, but, and, you know, beyond that, though, for me, if someone's like, man, I pay another one, why you always got to charge? It's like, you can go to my site right now and get beats for your entire album for like a hundred dollars total. And a lot of people give out free beats too. Like, I mean, you I, can I've find, done it. You can, you can find beats. Like, I mean, you can find beats like, you know, a good beats that you really like, you know, might, <laughs> might be harder, but you know, there's a lot of creative people making beats, you know, there's probably millions of beats on, on beat stars. Um, you know, you got to take your time to, to sift through stuff and, and find what, you know, your lane. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, people just need to be respectful of one another, respectful of one another's craft, uh, communicate well. Um, and like you said, just be educated on, on, you know, how things can be negotiated. And what are the different options for you and make the most sense for your business and manage your damn expectations too. If you're getting into this, th I shouldn't even have to say this, but I do. If you're, if you're trying to become a career musician, you're starting a business. Again, nobody expects to start a barbershop and not pay rent. No one expects to, to start a barbershop and have wall or Andes or whoever is out there send you a bunch of free razors. It's just not going to happen. You got to put money up front and take that risk. And I'm just so sick of people puffing their chest out, talking about I'm a businessman, I'm a CEO, I'm a producer, or I'm a rapper, this and that. Like, okay, cool. How are you a business person? How are you a CEO? What do you expect everything for free and do nothing to learn the business? what are you doing with, with, with your time and energy? It just doesn't make sense. Anyway, let's move on. Cause that's, that's, that's a brick wall. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so my topic for today is, you know, talking about releasing a project or releasing a single. I got hit up by a friend of mine. His name is DJ D sharp. Who's actually the, the official DJ for the golden state warriors. Um, so he's in the Bay area and he's working with a, a new collective that they have up there called Grand National that's headed by um, a, an artist formerly known as Irk the Jerk. Are you familiar with the, a lot of the Bay Area stuff kind of stays in the Bay, but he, he had no, I know Irk the Jerk, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he goes by Kevin Allen now. But anyway, so there's a collective and then there's like, you know, kind of like factions or groups that work 
together outside of the collective. Um, and he and they had re- so he was working with two artists and they had released a project that already so it already came out and he hit me up was like dang what can we do to promote it uh, so I want to just have a discussion about that you know because obviously that the best case scenario is you have a plan before you put something out right you have plenty of time you know you you, you upload it to Spotify you you submit it through Spotify for artists to try to get playlisting. You know, the more the more time, the better. And then you also have time to, you know, build up some anticipation, you know, but all is not lost if you put out a project and, you know, you haven't done that much promotion. You can still put together a pretty solid campaign and given how social media works and how streaming works, like you see a lot of songs pop, you know, years after they've come out, um, you know, but I think if you're thinking about release strategies you know i prefer if you can to have a cadence to your release strategy right like you know w- once a week is typically tough for an artist to put out a quality song once a week but if it's once every other week if it's once a month um you know i i i would encourage people to have a particular cadence so that you can kind of train your audience to know when stuff is dropping um and just kind of build stuff around that um so i think you know, so before you put out your project, and I think your promotion and marketing tactics, I think that you should have stuff that, that's ongoing that's like specific to your brand in general. But then there might be a particular song that you'll get more creative with because it's about something in particular, right? If a holiday's coming up and it's a Valentine's Day song, then you can have a whole bunch of creative ideas around that. Um, you know, if it's a, if it's a song called, I don't know, jumping jacks or whatever, like you can, you can come up with ideas around that, that are specific to that, but you should always have a system for how you release music. So, and what I, and what I mean by that is, you know, when we used to release a song, I basically kind of had like a long checklist of things that we would do on the day of its release, um, So I'm not talking about leading up to it. Let's just talk about the day of its release. You know, so obviously there's every social media platform has a way that we post, a way that we caption, um, because there's so many social media platforms now. And now within each social media platform, you have like different surfaces, right? So so, So Instagram has like five different surfaces. They have Reels, they have IG Story, they have the feed, they have, they, there's, so you kind of have to like work with each of these services to maximize, you know, your exposure on each of these platforms too. So even YouTube, YouTube's got a, like a story function. It's got a community tab. So I think now it's even more broad. And if I was releasing music today, the list would be even longer, but you want to have some consistency in how you present your release on, on each of those platforms that you have a, a presence on or that you work so there's that. And then separate from social media, you know, we would, I would have an email list. I would have two email lists. So I would have an email list of, of fans. And then I would have an email list of like influencers or industry people that I was just trying to keep abreast of what we were doing. Right. So I would have the email, I have two different email lists. I would have um, a text marketing list. Um, and then some ideas specific to each one of those, each one of the releases, you know, like I said, if it was like a, a particular topic, because if it's about coffee, for example, you know, you might want to DM some other pages that have more of a coffee focus or maybe a, a, a podcast that talks about coffee or something. Then you can just DM them and be like, hey, I'm putting out this song. It's about coffee. Um, I, I see that you have a podcast or a show on YouTube. Would you like to use my song in your video? Um, so there, there's a lot of that going on in the early days. If you have a song that you think fits something um, that other people are talking about, you just always want to find ways to collaborate. And I would encourage people to find a collective of artists where you guys can support each other. Now, DJ D Sharp, obviously they have a, a Grand National is the collective. So hopefully it's going to be easier for all of them to promote their music if everybody's on board. If everybody, if a song comes out, no matter who in the collective puts it out, everybody should be on board, like pushing it, you know, or pushing everybody to the Grand National platforms to get exposure. 
So there's a lot of different things that you can do to release a project, you know, so I think you can split it up into, you know, ideas that you have leading up to the project, a system that you have after the project, and then think about your brand in general, and then think about that song specifically to come up with more creative ideas. And I think if you look at it like that and come up with a more comprehensive plan, you know, I think that, you know, you, you can try to squeeze as much juice as you can out of whatever you're putting out. And the last thing I would say before, um, before you can chime in and, and, and add your thoughts, pain or, or questions, uh, sometimes the best promotion for the last song is another song. Um, you know, so just keep, keep a regular cadence of, of content coming out um, you know, and have that system, have that system in place so that there's some consistency in how you're releasing your, 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 your work. And then, you know, educate yourself to see if like how these social media platforms are changing to see if you need to make any adjustments to your system or add on to your system. So you might not, you might not have the contacts that I have, but you're adding to your Rolodex as you're building relationships, as you're putting out more music. So you're adding to that second email list, um, you know, you might meet a program director at a radio show that's not going to play your music right away, but you just want to keep them, you know, you want to let them know that what you have going. So it's a lot. I mean, it can be a lot, but hopefully if you're more organized and you have some consistency, you know, in, in your releases and how you're promoting stuff, you know, hopefully you get more traction and, you know, you put a lot of work into these songs. So you want to try to get as much exposure as you can. So just, come up with some creative ideas, um, you know, to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think cohesion is, is really important just because of the current landscape of music. Uh, you're talking about all the different surfaces. I mean, each social media site is now competing with, with TikTok. So they all have some kind of, even Twitter just added, what are they called? Um, I heard of like is, is fleet fleet with it? Yeah, it's like a story uh, story function. And I heard that they're gonna be you know have like a a clubhouse. They're gonna be compete with clubhouse, and they're gonna have like an audio platform. So it's a lot. And I I know that it gets overwhelming. I know that it gets overwhelming. You know, um, and 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 sometimes people are like, well, do I need to be on all platforms? I would say that you need to be where your fans are. If your target audience is on a platform, you know, I would encourage you to be there. But then I also know that like sometimes artists take a liking to one platform more than another. And it's, it's less, it's less of a job. It feels like less of a job and it's more fun if you actually like the platform. Um, So, you know, if, if, if you can be more creative on a platform, it's more fun for you, then, then make sure that, you know, you really invest heavily into that, but I wouldn't just ignore other platforms if they have people that fit your tar- target demographic. I mean, it's free to be on there. You might as well have some presence on there. Well, I think you said something that was key to what, what point I was about to make, which was about cohesion and just looking at all the different options for content and the necessity of using them all, um, whether it's a reel or a TikTok or a fleet or a story or um, whatever content you can post on the community tab on YouTube or a YouTube video or just a regular Instagram uh, timeline post or a tweet, you know, whatever it is, Facebook. Facebook is actually not dead. <laughs> um, if you would ask me three years ago if Facebook were dead, I probably would have given you an emphatic yes. Uh, now, really depends on the content. Um, I feel like video content well, I can't even say that because then you're going to say, well, Big Jaw just got 80 billion video views yesterday. So <laughs> for me, video content isn't doing great, but um, text-based and, and photo-based content is, is doing really well. Yeah. And it really just, I mean, obviously I work more with comedians now, so I'm not really checking to see what, what musicians are doing on Facebook. A lot of musicians have abandoned Facebook because they just think it's a desert and they don't think, you know, there's anything there, um, you know, but I've seen even some of the videos that other comedians put out, or even some of the ones that we've put out, like, I, so there was a video that Minx put out 
I think about a week ago. I didn't think it was strong at all. When he when I when I was watching it, I was I didn't I didn't chuckle at all. I was just like, you know, this this was a lazy one. This one was just put out. And then I looked the other day and it had two million views. Yeah. I was like, shit. I mean, I know, you know, we don't all have that same sense of humor, but you know, See? so I'm going back I'm going back and I'm I'm kind of studying, looking through the comments to see kind of where the funny was and what really, you know, got people's attention. Um, so you just never, my, my point is you just never know. Like when you're consistently putting out content, you know, as long as the content's good and it's getting better over time, you never know who's going to see it and when it's going to, you know, somebody, maybe a bigger platform shares it and the algorithm, you know, takes notice and it just starts spiraling out of control. You just never know when it's going to pop. And that's and why that's you'll still- never, you'll never write the next great um, Medea sequel, but for, <laughs> for, for just posting all this stuff on, on social media, I see so many people, either if they're doing it, they're just all over the place. It's like family photos, plus what they ate for breakfast, plus them working out, plus their song, plus them fishing, plus, you know, shout out to my wife, plus um memes it just, it's just a mess so there's no cohesion there so no one can just look at two or three posts and get an idea of what this person is about and then if and when one of their their songs or one of their posts takes off then they're not going to maximize that attention um I, I i knew that happened to a, a group that that i uh was sort of in a long time ago. They had a Facebook page back during like the big Facebook renaissance. And I think they posted some memes or something. And all of a sudden their, their page blew up. They got like a quarter of a million likes uh, on their page, but no one knew they made music. So when they started posting music, it just fell flat. Um, Mm, And so that, that was, I'm not saying they intentionally shot themselves in the foot. It just happened. Uh, But there's got to be some type of way to tie in all of the content that you post together. So on my Facebook page, if I post a meme, it's going to be producer related period or music related. So it makes, it makes more sense. And so the people that share that meme or see that meme being shared and go back to my page and say, okay, cool. This guy isn't a fishing enthusiast who just posted about production. This guy's actually a producer. So I'm going to, follow this person um and yeah you know to to speak to what you said about well i guess the other thing too is a lot of a lot of people you brought up another point about how it has to be fun and how you know you got to have fun doing these things because a lot of people will a lot of musicians will really be upset as they're planning their content strategy because they just don't want to do it like i don't want to Make and, it, and that and that'll show like yeah. you, you can't just do it like if you have that attitude you know your content is probably not going to be that that good um unless you're just good at faking it when you you know when you're miserable doing something um you know hopefully you find some some fun with it um yeah, yeah my bad i, I think no, I but that ha- exactly though that has to that has to be at the center of, of whatever content you create and that will help make it cohesive too, because anything that's authentic is going to, it's going to be beneficial to you. Um, But yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there are flukes. I feel like, so um, Ted Park, for example, we didn't do anything right when we released the single hello. We didn't even know it was going to be a single. Um, I remember one day he just said, I'm going to put it on Spotify and he did. And that was that was the defining moment of his career. Um, I don't know how it happened. He doesn't know how it happened. It got playlisted somehow. Um, we charted on this on the Billboard viral charts, and it was just kind of up from there. Uh, who know? I mean, sometimes the music just speaks for itself, and the timing is right, and, and things align. But for the most part, you know. And then after that moment, the challenge was playing the content game and, and engaging the fans and doing all of these other things. And the, the second, 
I think biggest career boost for him was doing back to back tours with one was with Dumbfound Dead and one was with Jay Park. So it was like that was the right thing to do for um building a fan base. And so I think content is important. Having a lot of content and consistently posting content is obviously important, but then really taking advantage of moments where if something is successful, you need to follow up. You need to maximize on that uh, success, even if it's small, even if it's medium. And if it's viral, don't ever kick your feet up and just watch the success dwindle. You have to take advantage of that. Uh, that's a big mistake I see a lot of people make. You know, And sometimes these moments are going to happen like randomly, but you can increase the chances of something oh, yeah. – Popping right, we j I just had a cat named Biddle on the MEC on Monday, and he shot up from I think like two thousand TikTok followers to forty thousand earlier this year, and then he went from forty thousand to one point five million. Um, and one of the pivotal videos that sparked a lot of that growth was, I guess, a remix of of, of Jack Harlow's song. Um, and he didn't even do this on purpose, but it just so happened that he dropped his remix on TikTok the same day that Jack Harlow dropped the official remix, right? So, but he didn't, he didn't do that on purpose, but it shows that you can foresee upcoming events that are going to be big and play into trending topics that you know are going to happen or quickly respond to trending topics that are happening yesterday or today or this morning, whatever it is, you know, to try to put yourself in the mix because people are looking for those hashtags, you know, it's top of mind, it's relevant, and it's probably going to, it's more likely to get, you know, favor, it's more likely to be favored by the algorithm, more eyes can see it, you don't know whose eyes those are, but you never know who's in your fan base, you never know who's going to see the content, but if more people see it, there's a higher chance that somebody of influence is going to see it and, you know, it increases your chances of having these moments. So sometimes it happens randomly, but, you know, put yourself in a position, think strategically, give yourself enough time to take advantage of that trending stuff that you know is coming, right? The Super Bowl, you know, is coming, you know, it might be a celebrity's birthday, you know, is coming. It might be the anniversary of a a hit song that you know is coming and that you know is going to be celebrated. So remix that, you know, Old Town Road when it came out, you know, or, you know, a big song. So you can do things on purpose, but always have your brand in mind. Like, you know, do things strategically, but always tie it back to your story so that you're not just doing extras for no reason. People are going to see that it makes sense for, for you. And then you can reach out to a producer and say, I'm not paying for this beat. I'm going to give you the back end and life is good. All right. So uh, again, this is the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast powered by BeatStars. And we are live on BeatStars.live every Monday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Dame, what is that phone number to text so that they can get alerted when we're live? Text MEC to 844-206-7800, um, and we'll send you a text before we go live every Tuesday and Thursday. Once again, appreciate you tuning in. This is the MEC Podcast. Until next time, peace. Peace.